I'm Cesar Delgado from Back Roads of Illinois. I am joining with Brady Hawk from Dodge City, Kansas for Advanced Trading. Good morning, Caesar. Afternoon, I guess it is. Thank you for having me on your show today. You're welcome to join the show, Brady. How are you? I'm doing great. It's been a busy week, um, a good week. If you're in the cattle business, um, in the grain side of things, it mm. hasn't been quite as fun, but it's been a great week out here. Weather-wise, we've had nice weather, starting to get a little cold here at the end of the week, but had some beautiful days to enjoy. Let's start with our conversation on Ag Outlook from yesterday in Washington, D.C. What is your opinion? Yep. Um, a lot of numbers to digest. Um, the acreage number, you know, for both corn and beans, I'd say it came in line with, uh, with a no more normal type of uh, environment, uh, less corn acres, more bean acres, uh, Three million less corn, three million more beans. <clears throat> so more of a traditional mix on the acreage number. Um, not very friendly numbers. Pretty bearish. So <clears throat> so didn't do anything to feed the bulls <clears throat> on that end of things. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, very uh, didn't didn't give the bulls any fire and to to <clears throat> send the markets higher. Um, and the markets obviously reflecting that as they ended the week very near the lows on the corn side of things. Can you tell to our listeners about the Conab from Brazil for the last week? Yep. Um, the Conab, there continues to be a, a significant divergence between the Conab corn production number and the uh, USDA WASDI corn production number um, going forward. And of course, that the Safrina crop has not been planted in Brazil. Um, but Conab continues to be much lower than the USDA number. Um, I'm of the opinion that Brazil farmers are going to plant more acres. And I think much of that discrepancy between Conab and USDA is on the acreage side of things. Mm -hmm. I think the Brazil farmer is going to plant more acres of corn than what Conab is penciling today. Mm -hmm. But we will see. The planting acres and producing bush week though so not a not a good week for corn um kc wheat chicago wheat finished down eight six to ten cents um on the day and very near the lows of the week um, beans are up 10 cents um, but they're still down 11 cents on the week so it's been how is the cattle markets for today yep um Feeders had a great day today, up three, three to four dollars. Uh, March contract closed up three ninety. The May contract closed up two seventy. Um, on the fat cattle, the live cattle side of things, uh, finished up a dollar to April up nearly two dollars, dollar ninety five today, uh, pushing, pushing higher and uh, high trade for the week. So it was great, great uh, finish here for the week on the cattle side of things. Um, moving higher. How about lean hog? Lean hogs. I'm I'm not a hog specialist by any means, but they have also had a good week here this week. Um hogs April hogs finished up 22 points, uh June hogs finished up 5 points, but they ha they've had a really good week this week. June hogs finished the week last week at 95 cents and and this week they uh, finished at 97.75. So very, very good week on the hog front. How do you see domestic cattle expansion for this spring or summer? Good question, Caesar. The, the supply side of the cattle picture has been very well documented, you know, lowest cow herd in the last 70 years. Um, we have yet to see producers retain heifers and expand the herd. I anticipate that we will start to see some of that here this year. Um, and, I, and I think you'll get some indications maybe in the Catalan feed reports coming in April, June, July, that time frame. Um, 
but the economic environment of 2024 is much different than it was in 2014 on the last time we had this type of market and in, in we're in this pattern of the cattle cycle the cattle market is very cyclical um, but interest rates are difficult right now as you're well aware um we've also got an you know an aging aging farmer aging rancher and i think there's people that are evaluating whether or not they want to continue to stay in the cattle business and they're having some decisions made of do i want to expand or not um, that might be slowing things a little bit. We also didn't have an election in 2014, 2015, and this is an election year. Um, but from the cattle expansion side of things, just to s- stick with that, I anticipate we'll start to see that going forward. Um, but it's really, really hard to pass up the dollars uh, that heifers are bringing in the market today. Yes, Caesar. I, yes. Um, I think they're past their rate raising cycle, but um, a lot of debate on when they will cut their cut rates um, and how aggressively they will do it. And there's uh, conspiracy theories into the political motivation potentially behind that. Um, but the the PPI data and the CPI data that we've had the last two weeks here, fr- last Friday and this Friday, um, weren't very supportive of those rate hu- rate reductions happening anytime soon. I think the chances of a March rate have all but fizzled and have um, pushed out into May, June potential for a rate decline. Um, But lots of debate and uncertainty there on if we'll see those rates come down. And I, my bias is. Insurance farmers and ranchers never been known about it. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's well, it's a great tool. And the USDA came in and revamped LRP, Livestock Risk Protection. They revamped that tool a couple years ago and made some changes that made it much more attractive tool for producers to use. Um, and we've also got some very great prices to go out there and protect, mm-hmm. record prices to protect. But Livestock mm-hmm. Risk Protection is a subsidized um, put floor, essentially. It's very much like a put. Uh, one of the, some of the benefits of it are you don't have to put the money up front. Um, so you either get a bill or you get an indemnity at the end of the policy. Um, and, and then it fits a much more flexible uh, head count, herd size. Not everybody has you know 50,000 pounds that they need to hedge if they were to do it with a Chicago put or a, um, a futures or options position. So there's flexible, um, you can ensure one head or up to 10,000 head. Um, but it's a great product that cow calf guys need to be looking at using um, very attractive for them to go out and protect prices. And they've got great prices to protect Caesar. Do you have final thoughts on Brazilian production and world agricultural outlook? Another good question. And I think one of the key things for U.S. grain market going forward. The trade, funds, managed money, we're all going to be watching Mm. what the Safrina crop, um, the weather down there in in Brazil particularly, um, and then how aggressive Brazil is with moving their soybeans. The U.S. is very uncompetitive on soybean price versus Brazil right now. Um, but, But things change, Caesar, and we're a month, a week away from some change in weather that um, can add some concern in or or build some risk premium into these markets and cause short covering rallies. And I think as a producer, we got to be paying attention to those opportunities and respect the downside when they happen and try not to get caught up in the the noise of um, why the market's moving higher when it does, if it does. But Brazil production is going to be key to your markets going forward. Then we transition into the U.S. production. It's going to be a wild and exciting year, Caesar. I would expect market volatility, and I'd make sure I have my ducks in a row and am prepared to uh, manage risk when I can, not necessarily when I have to. Thanks for coming, Brady. My pleasure, Caesar. You do a great job, and I appreciate you having me on. This is Brady Hawk from Dodge City. 
Kansas for advanced trading. This is Cesar Delgado from Back Roads of Illinois.